What's up, third service? Where are my slackers at? Here we are. You finally rolled in. Welcome to the show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm the third service guy too back home, so uh, you're in, I'm in good company. I've had all these time restraints up until now. <laughs> I got about an hour and a half. We'll see if you love me when this is over. Uh, Hey, we ain't got to worry about the parking lot now. I got me a captive audience here. So some of, some of you are going, oh, no. Oh, no. Get somebody to take care of that food. Um, hey, it's good to be here. It's good to be back in Oklahoma. I love this state. I really do. Um, love this state. You guys love God and do a lot of right things, you know, in the in a wrong world. So thank you, Oklahoma, and thank you guys right here in uh, Muskogee. Uh, holy go. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. I heard you're in the book of Acts, which is really exciting. You know, if you, uh, kind of like my dad always said, the book of Acts, if that doesn't fire you up, then your wood must be wet. So, uh, <laughs> It just fires me up, man. Reading those stories are just, it's just awesome. It's really the only book in the Bible that we have like that. Who And I was so interested in the book of Acts because, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are uh, the full gospel from Jesus from birth to the resurrection. And we only have the book of Acts. That was what happened next. And you know why that excites me? Because we're in the same boat they were. Post-Jesus resurrection, we're in the same boat. Jesus is not here. He's gone. We have the Holy Spirit. And, um, and so I was so interested in what, what took place in the book of Acts. What did they do? What did they see? Uh, because they had actually witnessed it. So uh, we're going to talk about action. Uh, speaking of Acts, we're going to talk about action. I want us to be thinking about Monday, not today, uh, because Monday's where the battles, it's going to start. And for so many times, what happens is, we come in and we celebrate Easter, or we come up here and gather uh, to gather what uh, most of us know as, as church. Uh, I'm going to address that too. Um, but it, it's but it it doesn't carry over. Like to me, what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen Tuesday next week? The rest of the week? There's six days in the week, and we all some of you guys have limped in here after battling uh, the evil one and the evil forces. Uh, of God. And so we've got to go and take this out of here. If it only happens here, we missed it. We missed the mission. We got an hour in here. If you're if the bar for you is an hour a week, man, you you are way off, okay? This is every day all the time every day. So we're going to be talking about Monday. Um I'm I'm coming from speaking of Holy Go. Well, I've been going a lot this year. I'm coming from Nashville, Tennessee. I spoke uh, Good Friday uh, with my friend Chris Tomlin, invited me up to speak uh, for that service at the Bridgestone Arena. There was 15,000 people there, a little bit bigger crowd than what's here today. Uh, there's a lot of folks in there, and I talked about the cross a lot, and actually it's a very similar message. Um, and I've been in the Bridgestone a lot over the years, uh, but I, I told this story there. Um Years ago, about a decade ago, I actually sang in the Bridgestone uh, one of our songs from our hit Christmas album, a Robertson, uh, Duck the Halls, a Robertson Family Christmas, uh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, with, with such hits as Harry Christmas, uh, which uh, I sang this night, because I never thought about actually singing. Like We had this idea, let's do an album. It'll be a Christmas album. We got in the studio. It was super fun. I, I never actually thought about being in front of a live audience and singing a song, and uh, which is not my forte. And uh, so I'm there and I'm singing this, I'm fixing to sing the song and I'm standing backstage and I'm white as a ghost and I felt like I was going to throw up. I was so nervous. And Luke Bryan, who I was singing with, looks at me and he's so encouraging and he said, what's your problem, son? I said, Luke, I'm nervous, man. He goes, why? This ain't even live. And he meant because it was being recorded for ABC to be aired later. So in his mind, it wasn't a big deal because it wasn't live. And I said, yeah, but the 
15,000 people in there are alive. And that's what I'm nervous because I've got to know the words to the song and sing it. And whew, we got through it. Um, so yeah, we, um, I'm not as nervous. Uh, I'm not nervous at all right now. And I wasn't even nervous speaking the other night because now this is my forte talking about Jesus Christ and the resurrection. Uh, and it's awesome talking with people who agree with me, but I kind of get excited when I'm talking to people who don't agree with me or who don't know anything about it as well. Uh, That excites me as well. Easter Sunday, I remember years ago, I was talking to a pastor and um, (laughs) he was talking about Easter Sunday and and I was speaking and it was a a weird deal, but we were both speaking and he wanted to know what I was talking about and I said, resurrection? (laughs) I don't know, what what are y'all talking about? Resurrection? Okay, we're all on the same page here. He was, we were talking about the visitors we had last year. And he said, we had so many visitors there. And I love pastors, you know, because they, they get so excited, especially about this. And they were like, I said, how many visitors did you have? He said, 550. 550 visitors? Yep, 550 visitors right here in this building. Boy, he was proud, you know. I said, that's amazing. That's unbelievable. I said, how many came back next week? How many came back? He was looking at me. He goes, well, the numbers were like they were the week before. And I went, huh. Now, in the business world, we would change up something (laughs) because something's not working. This is not a one-time thing. And I know we get a lot of visitors, but what is the purpose of getting someone to visit unless their life is changed by Jesus Christ? If you're just sitting here for one week and they'll see you again at Christmas, something's missing. Something's missing in our life. And so I don't want that to happen today. If you're in here and you're not right with God, today may be the day. Uh, If you're in here, you do love God. uh, Hopefully we can challenge you a little bit to start taking this message to other people. Um, I wrote a new book. uh, It's called Gospeller. It's coming out. uh, You can order it now, but it's it's coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, Gospeller is an old word, uh, really old word, like a couple hundred years ago. It used to be common language in our culture. Uh, People were known gospelers. Uh, It just meant they preached the gospel, either publicly or personally. Uh, Not necessarily pastoral like that, but it was more just regular folks who just always were talking about the gospel, and they were called gospelers. My wife found the word. I was writing the book, and it was about sharing your faith, and I was trying to help people with um, how to share their faith and all the barriers that we put up as to why we don't share our faith. And there's a lot of excuses to that. And my wife said, Hey, I found this old word. It means, and she showed me and I said, that's perfect. And so, um, so I made that as the title and some of the barriers are one of the, one of the most is, well, I just don't know the Bible well enough. I just don't know. I don't know the scriptures. I don't know. I'm not good at that. I had one guy tell me, this is so funny. I was teaching this class about how to share your faith. And this guy came in, he said, uh, I'm just, I'm not gifting, I'm not gifted at reading the Bible. <laughs> I said, that's not a gift, bro. That's just a discipline. You just read it, you know. You you just read. Can you read? Yeah but he didn't like reading the Bible. And so that was one, uh, I think, a lack of experience. I think we believed in a lie that uh, people tell us to keep that to yourself. And for some reason, we do it. We're like, okay, I guess we should keep that to ourselves. Um, So there's a lot of, uh, some people think your life is so bad. You're like, man, I live such a, last thing I need to do is be telling someone else about their life because mine's a mess. And that may be the case. You may have to clean up your own life. You certainly need to know your own story. You need to know what your story is, because if you're not confident in your relationship with Jesus Christ, and I promise you, there's a lot of people here today, you're not real confident. You've kind of got your fingers crossed going, I hope this is it. If you're not confident, I promise you won't share with anyone, because we don't share with other people stuff that we're not confident about, and so that's that holds people back, and so for whatever reason, look at the numbers, uh, Christianity is on the decline in this country. It's not growing. It's declining. And a lot of the evangelism, a lot of the stories that are passed down, you know where we're missing mostly as believers? It's with the kids. They're just, the world's just eating them up, chewing them up, and absorbing them into all this goofy thinking and stuff that we see, especially on the Internet and just losing our kids 
losing the family, losing that. So hopefully we can stir this up. I have witnessed a lot of, uh, so uh, turning darkness into light, one conversation at a time. Um, I would say, because it was funny, it made me think about Luke, Brian, not Luke in the Bible. Um, What was so confident to him, and I was mortified by the same event. And he was like, what? Because to him, it was just second nature. Like, go out there and sing, son. And that's the way I want sharing the gospel with other people is like that. If I were to meet any of you, or we were sitting together, and I would just start asking about your life. Like, how's it going? What, you know? And I would start asking questions. That's where it's going to begin. And then the Bible says, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have. And so that'll be my question today. That'll be a theme is, are we we prepared? Do we feel prepared? You may have to open your Bible and start reading it. Um, I've witnessed a lot of crazy things in my life. One was actually the the TV show itself, Duck Dynasty. Uh, I didn't, uh, you guys witnessed it. A lot of you watched it on TV. I was like there, like behind the scenes, in the scenes, uh, doing the whole thing. And uh, it was crazy. It was just what a crazy experience uh, that, that we got to do. And um, it, it, people, there were some network executives who didn't think it would work because the idea of reality television, as a lot of you have probably seen, is pretty much a train wreck of chaos in people's lives. You know, that's, and for some reason, we love watching that. Like, we love watching people. I, maybe it's because we think, at least, at least we ain't that bad, you know. And I even had people tell me, we're like, Willie, y'all do not do a television show you're going to lose your family. Everything's going to fall apart, and uh, that's always uh, possible. But I kind of thought, well, if we're not doing it, then then who else is going to do it? Who's taking the space? Who's got those slots? And so when Doug Nasty came out, it was like, we don't know if this is going to work or not, because this is going to be a show that's going to be clean, that everybody can watch. There's going to be no fighting or cursing. or um, It's going to end with a prayer. And we're like, we're just not sure that's going to work. Well, it worked. It, it really worked. It worked. It worked good. In fact, it didn't just work. It went all the way to the top. Uh, to this day, it's the most watched unscripted television show in the history of cable television. Um, yeah. With a prayer at the end with, you know, a family that loves God and, uh, and it worked. It was the opposite of every other reality show. Uh, Phil, uh, my dad, he Phil was not a big fan. He was, didn't want to do the show. And, and I said, well, Dad, I think it's a way to get the gospel out to more people. He's like, hmm, I ain't thought of that. So I said, well, I think it worked. He says, well, if we can do that, I'm in. And this is how Dad okayed the deal. He just gave me a thumbs up. And I said, all right, Phil's in. Uh but Phil wanted more preaching on the show, uh, which just cracked me up. He would say, well, we need to do more preaching on this show. I said, Dad, I, I don't think this show is like the preaching. There's another Robertson family that has a show. It's the 700 Club. I think they've already got that one covered. So let's just do like, let's, let's just have fun. If they want to know more, they can come uh, learn more. I'll never forget. Uh, the, <laughs> you're actually the only group that gets this story. Um we were sitting there at the end of like episode 100. So we had done these things so many times. And as you know, Phil's leading the prayer at the end of the show and then all the cameras are set up and they would roll the camera down the, the dinner, the, the dinner table. So as we had our heads bowed and it was just a, I can't remember what episode it was, but so he says, uh, the director goes, okay, Mr. Phil, we're ready and action. And so Phil bows his head and uh, we all bow our head to pray. And Phil said, Father, I pray for this bunch of heathens from Los Angeles, California, with their latte coffees and their funky language, and I pray you don't burn them all in hell for their sinfulness. Amen. And we were shaking because we were laughing so hard. Uh, None of us were expecting that prayer from Phil, and... uh, and the director, this young guy from uh, L.A., looks up. He goes, okay, Mr. Phil, thank you so much for that prayer. Now can we do one that we can actually uh, put on TV? <laughs> and so he did another one. But the show went to the top, and what that taught me was this. Um, you don't have to act like the world to be successful 
in the world, right? That's a lie. That's a lie from the devil that we think, oh, we got to get a little bit closer to the world if we're going to be successful in the world. And it's, no, you don't have to do that. And we were proof of that. I witnessed that with my own eyes. It was our claim to fame, uh, but it was certainly not the peak of our lives. It wasn't the mountaintop that we all stood up and raised our hand and goes, we made it, we did it. Uh, It wasn't even the most important thing in our life at all. Uh, It was a job and it was fun, um, but it wasn't the most important thing. The most important thing in our lives is what we are celebrating today, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what's most important to us. 1 Corinthians 15 is my favorite chapter in the Bible. Uh, My favorite book is Acts, but my favorite chapter is 1 Corinthians 15 because Paul starts it with the gospel uh, and he ends it with death and what happens at that point as well. But I want to read this to you. It says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. Think about that. What does it mean to take your stand on the gospel? Uh, That's a good question to think about. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, uh uh-oh. Some people didn't hold firmly to the word. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. You've probably seen that as I have. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. What Paul received, he passed on to this church in Corinth as of first importance. This is what's most important. Don't miss this. Paul's saying, do not miss this. Because what happens, we start forgetting what's most important, especially in church stuff. And we start forgetting what's it's, what's it's all, what, it, what it's all about. And here it is, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. That's what's most important. Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection. That's what gives us hope. If there would have just been a death, that would have been tragic and sad because he was a great guy. But if he never came back from the dead, if this day doesn't happen, would Paul say we should be pitied more than anybody? This is sad. This is terrible. But he did come back. And that's what's most important. So you see, our TV show was not the big thing. The it was a result of something else that happened decades earlier. Decades earlier, the gospel had changed our whole lives. So that was the most important thing. Doug Dynasty was the start of something new. It wasn't the end. It was the start of something new. The start of what, Willie? The start of a whole bigger platform to get the message of the gospel out. And we have tried to do that over and over through all the things, through the things we do with books and podcasts, stuff Sadie does. And uh, there's, I mean, there's, movie. There's all kind of things that we've done to get the gospel out. God gave us that and said, here you go, get after it. Doug Dynasty was not just the American dream or a piece of the American dream, as we hope that there still is a part of an American dream. That wasn't it. It wasn't like, wow, you guys are doing the American dream. It was a testimony of what happens when the gospel changes the nightmares our life become without Jesus Christ. That was the testimony. We just, and we put that down probably most clearly uh, in the movie we just put out called The Blind. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen The Blind uh, movie. Yeah, it's the, it's, the, it's the story of Phil and Kay when they came to faith, when they found their faith. Um, and ha- watching the movie, I mean, I witnessed it, um, living the life and seeing that. But it just made me think how close our family came to being over. Dad had kicked us out of the house. He was so lost and wayward and gone, and everything looked like it was just going to end, like a lot of families that we're probably part of and that we see, and certainly all around us, and it would have been over. But yet not for the gospel. That was the last hope. The last hope Phil Robertson had was the gospel. It was beyond marriage counseling. It was beyond... um, Anything, <clears throat> anything that was going to help, like even with mom, she couldn't minister to Phil. He kicked us out. He's out living in the woods by himself, running from the police. What could, how could this change? It, it looked hopeless. 
But his sister, my Aunt Jan, who's passed away now, she begged this preacher to go in this bar and preach to my dad. And she said, if you convert him, he'll convert a thousand. How she knew that, I still, to this day, I'm like, how, how could she see that? This guy looked like he wasn't going to be converted to anything. But his sister told that preacher that. And this preacher walked in that bar. <laughs> Phil had a pistol in his belt, big Budweiser in front of him. He said, what you selling, preacher? This was adversarial. This was not, he was not, hey, brother Bill. Phil didn't want to see this guy. And he had that courage to do that. He planned the seed. Phil didn't get baptized. He didn't say anything. He just said, I'll keep that in mind. Preacher goes on. We'll see what happens. And it was till Phil got at his lowest point. And in the movie, he says, when I got to the end of my life is when I could start doing something for God. And we have this glorious scene where Phil's baptized and, um, at the end of the movie. That's why I wrote the book, because I, that impacted me so much, because I think, what if that wouldn't have happened? What if that would not have happened? How would my life look completely different? It impacts, it impacts every one of you guys. Now you're going, how's it impact us? I wouldn't be standing here. There would have been no TV show. Y'all wouldn't even know who I am. I don't even know that I would be a believer. So it, 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 it impacts every day, every month, every year. It's been doing that for 50 years. Touching more people, touching more and more people. That TV show with the prayer at the end of it, that didn't just go in America, it went all over the world. So now we got prayers invited into people's homes and they're watching this. A lot of people weren't even believers. They're like, what, are we, what is this? What are they doing? So it just keeps impacting. Hundreds of millions of people have been touched by the gospel. And I can trace it back to one couple in South Arkansas with no money, no fame, no anything other than a brokenness, broken marriage, broken lives. And look what happened later. Look what God did. So you tell me that it can't happen in Muskogee? It can't happen with somebody that you're thinking about right now that's not here, that has nothing to do with this, that the gospel can't come in? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It ain't me because it has the power of salvation. But who's going to hear it unless someone tells them? That's the book of Acts. That's the book of Acts. That's the Holy Go. Look at over and over and over. There's nobody waiting outside that's going to kill us or drag us off to prison. That's what was happening in the book of Acts. A part of the problem is it's so nice and good and all that. It's, we struggle to get out there and get after it. I was, I was just in London. Uh, I, was, I was at this conference, and it was like super smart people and me. And, uh, <clears throat> and I mean, they're like people from all over the world, like Jordan Peterson, all these people. And so... So I've been listening to every theory and like how humanity, I mean, this is like serious stuff. It was like uh, serious stuff on humanity. It wasn't necessarily Christian at all. but And so I'm being interviewed by this lady from England, and she goes, Willie, what, what do you think we need to do about this? And I said, well, I guess we need to get up, get out there, and get after it. And she went, oh. <laughs> she goes, did you just say get up, get out there, and get after it? And I said, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm thinking. She was like, brilliant. <laughs> Sometimes it's the most simple way to put it, right? And I think that's what we need to do as well. What did Jesus tell us to do? Jesus told us what to do. He said, try to go to church and try to be a good person. That's what he said, right? <clears throat> that's not right. But how many of us sitting here right here today probably think that same thing? Well, I'm trying to go to church. People will see me and go like, I need to get back in church. I'm like, what? What does that even mean? I know what they're trying to say, but what does it mean? Because somehow we've gotten screwed up thinking we show up here for an hour and that's what we're supposed to do. No, it's way more than that. Jesus said at the end of Matthew, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. Three things. 
After they had witnessed what he did, they saw it with their own eyes. He told them to do three things, make disciples, baptize people, and teach people. There's my question to you. Are you in or around any of the three? Because if the answer is no, you need to check your mission. Because you may be way off mission if you're not in or around those three things. And you're going, wait, oh, wait, hang on now. Now you're making me feel guilty here. I thought that was his job. <laughs> I put some money in a plate and I give some money and that he's supposed to do all that stuff. Nope, that's not what Jesus said. And you're like, what? No, no, no. He told the tw- he told the disciples, the 11, he told them that. And they were like super experienced, religious, smart people, right? Nope. Y'all already learned this in Acts chapter 4. How did their peers view them as ordinary and unschooled men, but took note because they had been with Jesus? Well, we got any ordinary and unschooled people here? I can see some of you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for admitting it. <laughs> that means everybody. Well, Willie, that's not, I'm, I'm not comfortable doing that. Well, Tell your spouse that you're not comfortable. Tell your spouse today, say, look, I've decided something. I'm never going to mention your name to anybody that I know for the rest of my life. Your name will never come up in any of my conversations. It's not my gifting. (laughs) See how that goes. Wouldn't that be weird? Wouldn't that be weird if I never mentioned my wife Corey's name? I'm not comfortable talking about that. I whisper that. Sometimes we whisper. I love Christians. They whisper. They come and go, I'm with you. Yeah, good. You know, why do we whisper? I know why. Because the world and the evil one has convinced us, keep your mouth shut. Keep your mouth shut. Every one of those three things I just mentioned involves a conversation. You're going to have to open your mouth and talk if you're going to make a disciple if you're going to baptize someone, if you're going to teach, you need to talk. And I know you talk. You talk about everything. I've seen your Facebook stuff. We're talking about everything. We tell more stories. But when his story becomes your story, and that's the story you're always talking about, ah, you'll be getting close. You'll be getting close to being a gospeler. John chapter 4, there's a good story. Jesus and woman at the well. How complicated is it, Willie, to actually get into it to share my faith? Here's what the question was. Jesus said, can I get a drink of water? (laughs) That's where it started. How did it end? The whole town came to Jesus. Wow. And then there was her story. Acts chapter 8. You're coming up on that one in a couple of weeks. Philip, Ethiopian. The Ethiopian was in Jerusalem worshiping God on the way home, reading the book of Isaiah. Looked like a Christian, looked like a super Christian to me. Holy Spirit said, go up there by that chariot. I probably would have missed it. I probably would have said, the dude is good. He's just left worship, and now he's, you know, he asked a question. Do you understand what you're reading? How can I unless someone explains it to me? Boom. There he goes. Stopped on the way down back to Ethiopia, got baptized. 60 million, 70 million. Christians in Ethiopia today? Today? That was 2,000 years ago. I'm reading that story. 60% of the whole country is Christian. Don't tell me God can't do something with one person. Woo! One of the last things he said before he left the earth, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, Acts 1, chapter 8. You will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. What did that mean? It meant holy go. Go and tell people what you saw. Peter did just that. Acts chapter 2. Y'all have already talked about that. Peter got up. You, with with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. That was Good Friday. But God raised him from the dead through the glory of the Father right here. That's today. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Repent, change your life, be baptized. You'll get the Holy Spirit. Your sins will be forgiven. 
How many people? 3,000 one day. That was a big group. The book of Acts is full of big groups, small groups. It's all about what we go witness. We did not witness the cross. We weren't there. We did not witness the resurrection. We didn't witness it. They did. And you see how they lived their lives. But what do we witness? Every time you see someone die to their old self, you are witnessing a piece of the gospel. You are witnessing the beginning of what Jesus did. Every time you see someone who completely changes their life and now they walk and talk and sound like Jesus Christ, you're witnessing a new life. You are witnessing exactly what Jesus did. Read Romans 6, the first four verses of how we die, we're buried, and we're raised to a new life. My question to you is, where is your new life? Where's your new life? When did it start? If I'm sitting by you somewhere, that's probably what I'm going to ask you. Hey, when did that start? The same as I would ask if you were married. Hey, are you married? If I ask you you were married and you said, I hope so, I'm not sure. Wouldn't that be weird? Is that weird in Oklahoma? Because that's weird to me. But you know what I mean? People ask about the relationship with Jesus and that's what they say. I hope so. I don't know. Maybe. I hadn't thought about it in a long time. Hmm. That's the story. We got to care about people to be willing to care the story. We're witnesses. We are witnesses to our generation. We are witnesses to our generation. This is what our generation will get. Whether or not you tell them or not, we are the witnesses. We are the one God has put it on us saying, you go tell them. You wholly go and go tell them. This is not a Sunday morning thing. This is not an Easter Sunday. This is every day, every day, every week. Because what we are witnessing right now is a world that is getting darker and darker. You guys feeling that? I'm feeling it. Are you seeing that? Are you seeing what's happening in the world? My question is, what are we doing about it? Are we just telling everybody else how bad the world is? Jesus didn't say that's your mission. He didn't say go and tell everyone how bad the things you are seeing. But yet we do that every day. We get on social media and we gripe and we complain. And the whole time we're not telling anybody good news. There's a chapter in my book called Hope Yeller. Rhymes with God's speller. We should have hope on our lips and some good news. So let's go out from here. Let's take in, let's celebrate today, but let's get started on Monday living this out just like they did in the book of Acts. All right? See you tomorrow. Let's go do it. Thank you, guys.